Each week, the Bible as Literature podcast brings you in-depth discussion of the biblical text in a format short enough for your morning commute, but long enough to be substantive, posing difficult questions meant to keep you engaged. If you value this work, please consider donating as little as 25 cents per episode. That's just $1 per month. To learn more, please visit patreon.com forward slash Bible. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Bible. Thank you. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos with the Bible as Literature podcast. Thus far in Luke's genealogy, the writer has emphasized two critical points within the broader storyline of the New Testament. First, after paralleling Matthew's dismissal of Joseph's patrimony, Luke builds on Matthew's handling of Hebrew terminology in Genesis, pushing the biblical tension between the positive, godly expression, Son of Man, and the pejorative, worldly title, Son of God. Pejorative, according to the Bible's lexicon, but not in the uncircumcised minds of those hearing the New Testament. It is this sin that Matthew, Mark, and now Luke hope to correct or reformat in our hearing. Only now will Luke use the expression, Son of God, only the second time in his Gospel, and even now only within the tedious syntax of his genealogy, Son of Man, Ben Adam, Son of God. Perhaps later when we hear John we will finally understand why Jesus was accused of treason. For now, in Luke's Gospel, we need only recognize why Jesus kept telling people to keep their mouths shut in Mark. It is not because he was shy or humble. It is because they did not know what they were talking about and therefore should not be allowed to preach. At least, not yet. In Psalm 82, we find everything we need to know about the Bible's use of these terms. Calling specifically upon Elohim, not Yahweh, not the Messiah, to judge the earth along the lines of Ezekiel and Isaiah, David calls upon Elohim to rise above all the other gods as the only king upon the earth. All these gods, the sons of the Most High, who exercise power on earth, are hoaxes. From generation to generation and age to age, they are a fraud. They will die like the sons of men and fall like any of the princes because they themselves are sons of men, just like you and me. They will pass away, but our God, Elohim, is in the heavens, unseen and untouchable. He does not die, and his words will abide forever. Elohim alone is the judge who subdues unjust rulers, those who show partiality to the wicked. Elohim alone is the judge who vindicates the weak and the fatherless, who cares for the afflicted and the destitute. Elsewhere, David proclaims, Put not your trust in princes, in sons of men, in whom there is no salvation. When Luke, carrying the torch for Matthew and Mark, is finally ready to shout from the rooftops what Mark was certain you did not understand. He hopes that you will finally realize the value of Jesus Christ. That unlike the princes and rulers who will condemn him in the story, he was not glorious upon the earth. Instead, he was obedient to his father, the only judge. And that is why Elohim will arise to vindicate him, standing in the midst of his counsel as judge. Richard and I discuss the Gospel of Luke, chapter 3, verses 32 to 34.
You're listening to the Bible as literature. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos. And this is Dr. Richard Benton. And you are listening to episode 486 of the Bible as Literature podcast. This past week, in my homily on Matthew chapter 10, I took the opportunity to say something about Psalm 82. That is a text that we chant on Holy Saturday, and it ends with this prayer. The king asks Elohim to arise and judge the earth because all of the nations belong to him. And of course, when people hear this in a Paschal context, they misunderstand and assume that the psalmist is referring to the Messiah, but that is incorrect. The psalmist, who is the king, praying in the temple to Elohim, is calling upon God to judge all of the earthly rulers, of which the Messiah is one. So when you hear this text in a liturgical setting, it is God the Father, it is Elohim, who is rising to judge all of the kings and the princes and the rulers, the earthly gods who wrongly condemned God's anointed, his locum tenens, the Messiah, who wrongly sentenced the Christ to death, which is what Paul talks about in Romans. So effectively, God the Father, who is the only judge who stands out above all other gods in Ezekiel, who is the only one who stands out on the earth in Isaiah is arising to judge all of the gods and to reverse their wicked and unjust condemnation of his locum tenens for the sake of the poor. Already in Psalm 82, there is this emphasis which is taken from Genesis. So I can't even say, Rich, already in Psalm 82, because right from the beginning in the Old Testament, there is this putting down of the sons of men. That is the teaching of Scripture. The sons of men are subdued under the authority of Elohim. Yet somehow... They want to elevate themselves as gods. They want to be the sons of God in Genesis. They view themselves as gods. They want to be the princes and the rulers. That's what they want to become. They want to build the Tower of Babel. They want to rise to the heavens. They want to express their haughtiness, but there is only one who is haughty. And so when we hear Matthew at the outset of the New Testament, we want to, once again, hear the story of Jesus from that perspective. Yet in Psalm 82, not only is he a son of man, at least as it's applied liturgically in our tradition, now, before you disagree with me and argue, look at the Hebrew text. It doesn't say, arise, O God, generically. It says, arise, Elohim. It's not talking about the Messiah. And Matthew refers to Jesus as Ben Adam. Which means if you hear Psalm 82 and you hear Matthew, you're stuck. That's where Matthew puts you. You want Jesus to be this mighty, glorified, powerful ruler from your human perspective according to your human reference, which means that you want to be like the other gods who condemned Jesus. 
That's what we are. Matthew won't allow it. You're not trained yet scripturally. You're a Gentile who's just being grafted in. There is no third kind. You're either grafted in by hearing scripture or you're just not grafted in and you're one of the many among the nations. Don't make something special out of the baptized. You're mishearing scripture. So you have to be circumcised in the foreskin of your heart. And of course, Matthew begins by introducing you to the Hebrew language with the genealogy. But throughout the text, you are forced and you are trained to hear and understand that Jesus is a Ben Adam. It is only much later when you reach the genealogy of Luke that you are allowed to hear that Jesus is the Son of God, but not according to the reference point of the sons of men that are under judgment in Psalm 82, but according to Luke's reference point. In Matthew, you have Abraham and then the division of history into certain epochs, you know, a certain number of years before the deportation and after the deportation and that sort of thing. So it's in reference to Abraham, which was the one who was brought out of his land into the wilderness before entering into the promised land. And then we have the deportation and leaving deportation and back and forth. So in Matthew, the genealogy is lined up in such a way to force us to think in terms of coming out and coming in. And then lo and behold, as soon as we meet Jesus, it's about him going in and out of Egypt. This is how Matthew uses the genealogy to begin the story. In Luke, we begin the story already with Jesus's not just baptism, but the declaration of his father saying, this is my son. So it's a very strange thing to say, okay, we already know whose son he is. Why would we do the genealogy after that? It seems superfluous. But we've been saying time and time again that it's repetitious and boring to find out how many times God tried to give human beings a chance and then human beings blew up the chance and they tried again and they blew it up. They tried again, you know, the repetition of Matthias and Mathas and these names of the gift of God that keeps coming up. We finally get to the point today in the overlap between Matthew and Luke, besides Salatiel and Zerubbabel, we talked about that previously, but now we have an overlap with the rest of the Bible. Matthew actually with Abraham and moving through was trying to be very close to what you find in the Old Testament. But as we've said in Luke, it's a lot more difficult to try to track why these names and where these names come from. Ultimately, we say that there's a meaning in the words themselves, not the imagined people, personas behind the names. It's the names themselves that are important. So we get to this crossing point. Last time we talked about David, we reached another overlap between Matthew and Luke. But in Luke, like you said, Father, this idea of what is the Son of God that was declared previously, and now we're eventually working our way back to Adam, the Son of God. So you have Adam, the Son of God, and everyone after that is a Ben Adam. But ultimately, these kings end up with a bust. They end up with Joseph and it goes nowhere. But we have Jesus who is exceptional only because God declared him to be exceptional. This is my son. This last point is critical. And that's why I want to keep coming back to Psalm 82, Richard. And honestly, it relates very much to your work on Hebrews also. Because from the vantage point of Paul's teaching, I mean, if you hear Psalm 82, the way Paul hears the Old Testament, in Romans and presumably in Hebrews Jesus as a Ben Adam is no different than any other human being under the authority of Elohim what distinguishes him in Hebrews is that he is obedient Jesus in 
Hebrews has a special role as the great high priest who doesn't have to sacrifice on behalf of his own sin, but can sacrifice on behalf of the sin of the people. So he doesn't have to keep performing the same sacrifice year after year after year. He also is the sacrifice himself, and it's by his blood then that the covenant is established so that he himself is the inheritor of the kingdom. This is how Jesus functions in this story, because he is the one who is placed in this role, and he is obedient to that role. Not to mention, as has happened more than once throughout the Bible, God himself intervenes so that Jesus's mother is pregnant with him. He is not a son of Joseph, ironically, since we're doing the genealogy of Joseph right now. He is the son of the intervention of God when God decides he wants to stand and judge the nations. And his victory is then Jesus, because don't forget Jesus, Yeshua, doesn't just mean salvation, it means victory. Jesus is the victory. Jesus is the result, meaning victory is the result, when God arises and judges the nations. But our listeners must not fall into the trap of making out of Jesus an MCU superhero. That is an essential point here, Richard. He is an ordinary Ben Adam. The operative word that you used is obedience. He is ordinary. He gave his parents a hard time. He struggled in the Garden of Gethsemane in more than one gospel. And I look forward to hearing Luke in the coming weeks when we eventually get to the passion narrative in this gospel it's not as simple as people imagine we project superhuman status onto jesus because we're looking for our greek hero we're all hellenists we all want captain america and iron man that's what we want but that's not what this is in fact, the value of his obedience in Hebrews is precisely that he's a Ben Adam, in contrast with the wicked rulers and princes in Psalm 82 that are the cause of suffering and persecution and the mistreatment of the fatherless and the widow and those who are abandoned to weakness and misfortune. On the earth that's the victory that the fatherless are vindicated when Elohim rises from his throne to set straight the crooked judgment of the false rulers he determines according to his wisdom that Jesus was correct and wrongly condemned but as you were explaining it's interesting now as we've gone through the repetition of the monotony of human generations in Luke, we suddenly come to this slip slide in verses 32, 33, and 34 that take us to Abraham following the same path as the Gospel of Matthew in reverse, but the genealogy does not end there. It's a slip slide that goes to Abraham but past him. And that's why we're coming back to this point of Luke's definition of terminology versus Matthew's suppression of terminology. Both writers are interested in our mishandling of the phrase Son of God versus our understanding of the expression Ben Adam. But Luke is now taking us all the way in the hopes that we've been hearing scripture, going all the way back to Matthew. The son of Jesse, the son of Obed, the son of Boaz, the son of Salmon, the son of Nashon, the son of Aminadab, the son of Admin, the son of Ram, the son of Hezron, the son of Perez, the son of Judah, the son of Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham, the son of Terah, the son of Nahor. These are very familiar. So many of these names before they appear one time in the Bible, but these definitely do not. You know, these are all coming from Matthew 1, 2 through 6. And they're, you know, some of the greatest hits that we have from Genesis through Samuel. We begin with the grandfather of Abraham 
and move all the way through Jesse. So these are all names that we have elsewhere. So this is a little bit different than what we've been covering before, because before we've been emphasizing how we just have these names that just don't have any story attached to them. They're simply the word. So by stringing these words together, we do build this story. Now here we have this story that's already has a precedent, both in how it's used in Matthew and how it's used throughout the Old Testament. It's a story that ties the entire Old Testament together. This is a major part of the Matthean genealogy, but as we can see, it's just three verses of a very long, much longer genealogy in Luke. And as you said, Father, it underscores that the story goes back before Abraham. Matthew began with Abraham. Everyone is the son of Abraham in the genealogy that Matthew puts forth. Here, no, Abraham is just one more in the line. He had a father. He had a grandfather. Next time we'll read about his great-grandparents. I mean, it goes all the way back. So even Abraham and the famous story of his faith and of his obedience is, as you said earlier, Father, just one in a line. It's one in a line. Jesus' obedience is exceptional in that it was the result of God's direct intervention, which is on its own, not special, but then his ultimate obedience, which we saw in Matthew and Mark, which leads to his own death, his self-sacrificial obedience, the complete crushing of the ego in order to fulfill his father's will. Abraham is even less special in this genealogy than he is in Matthew, because he's not the father of the entire line. He's another one of the sons in this thara, which is the Greek version. But this potential for obedience appears now and again through these gifts that are given all the way through, through these opportunities that God has given all the way through in these kings, but are never taken until God finally intervenes with the one whom he declares his son, Jesus. This obedience of Christ within the context of Hebrews is a biblical principle that transcends the audience of that particular book. Christ is a Ben Adam who is the last in the line of God's anointed that even bears out in the parables of the New Testament. Finally, God sent his son. Surely they will listen to my son, which means he sent others who were obedient. And all of these characters in the story were rejected by the wicked princes and sons of men. That's just how the story goes. Jesus, within the confines of the biblical story, was the last, and he will be the last in this genealogy in Luke. And once again, when we lift up our eyes from this scroll that we are studying together, which is the most important thing we do every week, to sit together and read the sacred text, when we lift up our eyes and we look at the world around us, it's very clear that whatever was accomplished by Christ in the gospel, the world is still a mess. So it begs the question, what is accomplished here? Christ, as the last in the canon of Scripture to be obedient, opens the way for all of us to understand our duty to be obedient to this teaching. He was obedient in the most strict way possible to the law of Moses and presented to us, as it says in Hebrews, you were just explaining to me when you were relaying your work in Bible study in Hebrews, he is, and we just heard this epistle this weekend, in fact, in parallel with Matthew. He presented to us an even more perfect, more strict, more difficult way to be obedient. So we, as ordinary sons of men, have a responsibility to be obedient. That's the challenge. It's an instruction. It's wisdom. The value of this story is its imposition, the burden it places on us to live in a certain way. 
It's a challenge. It's a proposition. It's not magic. Jesus is presented to us as an alternative to the tyranny of Herod. That is the victory salvation that's being proposed. If it had been so important to obey the law that was given from Moses, how much more so to stay faithful to the teaching that Jesus gave? If it was so important to follow the regulation set down in Torah, how much more so is it to be obedient to the teaching that Jesus teaches, that Jesus gives? Thanks very much, Dr. Benjamin. Thank you, Father. You've just heard the Bible as literature. Thanks for listening. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.